It is my great pleasure and privilege that I have the opportunity today to go down the memory lane and recount some of my adventures with Ropalidia marginata, an endlessly fascinating tropical primitively eusocial wasp. I've spent my entire career, more than four decades, in the company of this beautiful social wasp, which we fondly call the Indian paper wasp. The journey of studying this wasp has been one of great fun. And the fun has been enhanced by the fact that I have throughout this journey, I have been accompanied by a large number of equally passionate students interested in prying open the mysteries presented by this primitively eusocial society. We've had many questions. We've had many strands of research. And what I will attempt to do today is to pick one such strand and try to give you a bird's eye view of how we have gone about studying this wasp. And the strand I want to use is concern, concerns cooperation and conflict. Being a primitively eusocial wasp, there is no morphological caste differentiation between the queens and the workers. In fact, I cannot tell who the queen is in the, amongst these wasps unless I actually see the queen laying an egg. Now, because of that, Individuals, when they eclose as adults, are nearly totipotent. Any individual can either become a queen or become a worker. Even more interesting, they can switch roles later in life. Queens can become workers, workers can become queens. Workers can replace their queens and become new queens in the same colony. Or if they are unable to do that, they're able to leave their nest, found their own nest, either singly or in groups, and become functional queens in those new colonies. Even more important is that this wasp lives in a tropical climate, which means there are no severe winters. Colonies can go on for a long period of time. Colonies can be founded and abandoned and queens can be replaced throughout the year. And in fact, can go on from year to year. So this provides tremendous opportunities, both for conflict and for cooperation among the wasps. And the question that we have really been interested is how do the wasps actually manage to balance the opposing forces of conflict and cooperation, which they seem to do very well. So that's the strand I want to take and give you a bird's eye view of how we have investigated the wasps way of balancing conflict and cooperation. But before I do so, I want to say a few words about the process of science. I believe that the process of science is as important as the product. Unfortunately, most of the time, we only talk about the product of our science. We do not talk about the process. This makes the product sound as if we got it by magic. And this creates a barrier between the researcher and his or her audience. Therefore, I believe that we should make the process of science as transparent as possible. And I will try to do that during this talk. So let me say a few words about how research actually happens in our group. My students and I, have great fun watching these wasps. And we often watch wasp colonies just for fun. While we do so, very often questions arise in our mind. We realize that some of these questions are difficult to answer, some probably impossible to answer. But every now and then a question pops up, which we think we can answer if we design an appropriate study. So we design a study and we try to answer that question. And when we answer that question, we keep that answer as tentative because the answer immediately raises other questions. And unless we can answer those questions, our confidence in the answer to the first question is limited. When we answer those questions, yet other questions arise. So our research proceeds as a series of questions and answers. There is no reason, therefore, why I should not present this talk as a series of questions and answers. Now we are able to answer these questions because of some simple technical advances. Perhaps the most important technological advance is our ability to mark individual wasps with colored spots of paint for individual identification. As you can see on this slide, lots of wasps can be marked for individual identification. In fact, we have computer files on most of these wasps, in many cases, detailing their entire lifetime of behavioral activities. And 
One of the good things, one of the many good things about this was, is that it likes to nest around human habitation in our gardens, in our offices, in our buildings. In fact, sometimes they come and build their nest voluntarily in our lab. Therefore, we can easily study them wherever they are in their natural condition. But it's equally easy to bring them to the lab, transplant the whole nest into cages and stack up lots of cages in our lab, which we call the Vespiri. In fact, recently we have constructed much larger nests, which we call walk-in cages. And these walk-in cages allow us to do new experiments, which the older cages, the smaller cages did not allow. And I will have opportunity to describe at least one or two of such experiments. So I have succeeded in transplanting not only Ropalidium marginata nests, but also my student into these walk-in cages so that observations can be made in nearly natural conditions. So let me begin with a series of questions and answers. Because this is a primitively used social watch and workers and queens don't look any different, the very first question I was interested in is, how does the queen behave as compared to the workers? If she doesn't look different, she must at least behave, behave differently. As far as we can tell, there is no qualitative difference in the behavior of the queen compared to the workers. So the difference is quantitative. And in order to capture this quantitative difference in the behavior of queens and wasps, we constructed time activity budgets for all marked wasps in the colony. How much time does each wasp spend in each kind of behavior? We then subjected this data of time activity budgets to multivariate statistical analysis, such as principal components analysis and cluster analysis. And very interestingly, we found that wasps in every colony can be classified into three rather distinct clusters, which we call behavioral castes, based on the major behavior that these clusters perform, we named these behavioral casts as sitters, fighters, and foragers. Now, one of the precautions we took in doing this study is we deliberately did not treat the queens differently. If the queens don't look different, who are we to treat them differently? So in other words, we didn't tell our computer who the queen was. The happy result of that was that we could now post facto ask, where is the queen? Is she a sitter? Is she a fighter? Or is she a forager? We strongly suspected that queens must be in the fighter caste, in the fighter behavioral caste, because it was known at that time that in such primitively used social societies, especially those of wasps, the queen rules by physical aggression, by harassing her workers and making them to work and suppressing their reproduction. But to our great surprise, we found that our queens were not fighters. They were in fact always sitters. So the answer to the first question is that the queen in Ropalidia marginata is a non-aggressive, non-interactive, meek and docile sitter. Now this answer, as I said, we put it on hold, we put it as, as temporary because this raises other questions which need immediate answers. If the queen in fact is such a meek and docile sitter, how does she become a queen in the first place? Why do the workers respect her authority? Why do the workers not revolt against her? And they do not revolt because in the presence of a healthy queen, workers never ever lay any eggs. They never physically challenge the queen. And so why, how does this happen? So in order to answer this question, we decided to do an, a different experiment. So now we have to design a study to answer this question. And this study we designed required three days of experimentation. On day one, we identified a healthy, normal colony, marked all the walls, and studied all the walls. And here by studied, I mean constructed time activity budget for all the walls. On day two in the morning, we physically removed the queen. And we spent the rest of the day observing the walls without the queen. At the end of day two, we returned the queen. And on day three, we again observed all the walls with the queen. So day one is a queen right stage. Day two is a queen determination stage because they don't have a queen. And day three is the queen re-establishment phase. To our great surprise, we found that as soon as we removed the queen, this normally not so aggressive colony, there are low levels of dominance, subordinate interactions amongst the workers. Not the queen is not involved in this, but amongst the workers. But as soon as we removed the queen, all hell broke loose. It became a hyper-aggressive society. And the rates of dominance, subordinate interactions interactions increase several fold, two fold, three fold, we have seen up to 30 or 40 fold increase in the rates of dominance of online interactions. What is most fascinating is that all of this new aggression is by one of the workers. So one and only one worker becomes hyper aggressive. As you can see in this, in this graph, 
on day two, in the absence of the queen, one worker shot up her rates of dominance behavior, whereas she was showing very low levels on the previous day in the presence of the queen, and she dropped her rates of aggression upon the return of the queen. Now, it turns out that if we don't return the queen, this particular wasp will go on to become the next queen. So we call her the potential queen. So the answer to our question is potential queens begin their careers as very aggressive individuals and only later become make and tosser. But this answer also has to be put on hold because if the queen is such a meek and docile sitter, how does she regulate the activities of the workers? Because she's not being aggressive. So in order to answer this question, we designed yet another experiment. We focused on two activities of the workers, bringing food to the nest and feeding the larvae. And we focused on these behaviors in the presence and in the absence of the queen and after return the queen. And to our great surprise, we found that there's absolutely no effect of the presence of the queen. The rates at which food was brought, the rates at which larvae were fed, were statistically indistinguishable on day one, two, and three. Whether the queen is there or the queen is not there, the workers don't need any input from the queen in order to bring food and feed the larvae. So our simple answer was Ropalidia marginata queens do not regulate the activities of the foragers. But somebody should, and who does that? So we suspected that the workers do it themselves. And how do they do that? We suspected that the low levels of dominant subordinate behavior that the workers indulge in is actually used for self-regulating their activities, such as foraging and feeding larvae. In support of that, so what is the function? So I'll be asked, what is the function of the low level of dominance behavior shown by the workers? We found a weak but statistically significant positive correlation between the fraction of dominance received by a worker and her fractional contribution to the foraging effort of the colony. So this gives some kind of support to the idea that the workers may be using dominance behavior to tell each other how much food to bring. We tested this explicitly in two different ways we showed that excess food reduces dominance behavior. So we hand fed the wasps, kept them satiated, so they're not hungry. And we, we showed that if you do that, the rates of bringing food came down, the rates of feeding larvae came down, but also the rates of dominance behavior came down. In fact, the rates at which dominance behavior was shown specifically to the foragers came down significantly. We also showed this in the opposite way, showing that excess food actually increases dominance behavior when we, uh, uh, starvation actually increases dominance behavior. So when you starve the wasp, dominance behavior increases, not general aggression because they are irritated, but specifically the dominance behavior shown to the foragers actually increases. So yesterday's foragers were attacked much more today because the wasps were hungry. So our answer is that worker dominance behavior is used for the decentralized self-regulation of foraging by the workers themselves. But that raises another question. How does a meek and docile sitter inhibit worker reproduction? Okay, she doesn't care about worker behavior because they organize it themselves, but how does she ensure that they do not challenge her? They do not develop their ovaries and start laying eggs. In order to answer this question, we designed a very different kind of experiment. We suspected that the queen probably uses pheromones to suppress worker reproduction or to regulate worker reproduction. And in order to see whether this pheromone is volatile or non-volatile, we conducted a different kind of experiment. We brought the wasp colony to the laboratory, put it in a cage, and on day one, we observed the behavior of the queens and the workers. On day two, we cut the nest in half, roughly dividing the brood equally to two halves, and randomly introduced half the wasp on one side, half on the other side, introducing a wire mesh in between. Now, the function of the wire mesh was to prevent the wasp from going across, but allow volatile chemicals to go across. Now, we observed both sides. We actually put the queen on one randomly chosen side, and we observed both sides. There was a queen right side and a queen left side. On day three, we moved the queen from wherever she was to the opposite side and again repeated the observation. Our predictions from such an experimental design were that if the queen pheromone is volatile, both nest fragments should behave like queen right colonies. But if the queen pheromone is non-volatile, the queen nest fragment should behave like a queen nest colony. Now, we have found that this experimental design is very useful even to answer other questions. And I will have opportunity to bring it up once more. When this slide was made, such an experiment was already performed 24 times. And in all cases, prediction two was applied. So our answer, 
So here is what the data looks like. On day one, nobody shows any aggression. Neither the queen nor the PQ1 or the PQ2. But on day two, on the queenless side, one individual becomes hyper aggressive. We call her PQ1. And when we move the queen to her side, she loses her aggression. But a different individual on the new queenless side becomes hyper aggressive. We call her PQ2. And nobody showed aggression on day one, but they showed aggression respectively on days two and three. So our answer is that Rocolatia marginata queens appear to use non-volatile pheromones to inhibit worker reproduction. This raises the question, if the pheromone is non-volatile, how do the workers actually perceive the pheromone? Now, we tested various hypotheses. Our first hypothesis was that workers receive the queen pheromone through direct physical interaction. We ruled out this hypothesis. Our second hypothesis was that workers receive the queen pheromone through indirect physical interaction or by relay through the queen. We ruled out both these hypotheses by the following method. We computed the rates of physical interactions between all pairs of wasps. We then computed the shortest path of information flow from the queen to the PQ, both directly as well as relayed through the workers using the Dijkstra's algorithm. And we found that the PQ detected the absence of the queen too rapidly, in less than 30 minutes, for information to actually reach her through physical interaction. So now, by simple behavioral observation, we showed that the queen applies her pheromone to the nest by rubbing her abdomen on the nest surface. And the workers then can get it by contact with the nest. A big question that loomed large in our research, in my entire research career, can we predict the identity of the potential queen in the presence of the old queen? As soon as you remove the queen, within 30 minutes, a single individual becomes hyper-aggressive. Who is the potential queen? Who in fact will go on to become the next queen? But which worker, who is this individual, was a question of great interest. And for a very long time, we couldn't answer this question. When people would ask me, can you predict the identity of the PQ? I would sort of casually say, doesn't look like it. There seems to be nothing special. But after a while, when these questions became very persistent, we designed specific studies to try and answer this question, to try and predict. And it turned out that initially we failed. In fact, this is one example of a study where we showed that the potential queens and the workers are all mixed up. You cannot tell them apart. Only the queens are different. In other words, we cannot identify the potential queen in the presence of the queen. The potential queen does not appear to be unique by any criteria, not by her dominance rank, not by any other behavior, not even by her ovarian rank. Workers have low level of ovarian development, but even there, she is not particularly uh, unique. So at this stage, we could not. But I will come back and revisit this answer, whether we can actually predict the queen. At this stage, a student came to my lab and said, we don't know who the PQ is, but I wonder whether the wasps know who their next queen is. Do the wasps know who their potential queen is? At first, it appeared that this question may be difficult to answer. But when we framed it more scientifically, it became uh, promising that we could ask. So the scientific way of framing this question is, is it possible that there's a hair designate, even though we cannot identify her? And do the other wasps really know who this hair designate is? Now, I'll spend a few minutes explaining how we conducted an experiment to answer these questions, because otherwise people would not believe that we can actually answer this question and we can show that the workers actually know who their next queen is. Here is, once again, we use that experiment where we cut the nest in half and put a mesh. So the design of the experiment is as follows. So imagine that we take a wasp nest, cut it in half, half the workers on one side, half on the other side, queen on one side. Now, assume that there is a hair designate. Assume that everybody knows. So what would we expect? We would expect that in such a situation, on this queenless side, the queenless side would think that they don't have a queen and one individual, let us say one individual, would become hyperaggressive. So let's imagine that the hair designate is actually sitting on the opposite side, not on the queen side. Now there is no problem, this hair designate will immediately become a potential queen. So let's call her PQ1. Now she, however, is not the hair designate just for her side, but for the entire colony. So to test whether she is really the hair designate, we interchange the positions of the PQ1 and the Q. We move the PQ1 to this side and the queen to the other side, and we ask whether the PQ1 is challenged here. And she should not be challenged if she is the hair designate. We move her back, there should be no problem. The first individual to become hyper aggressive should be acceptable to both sides in the absence of the queen. 
But this situation will only occur in about half the experiment because in the other half, by chance alone, the unfortunate hair designate would be sitting next to the queen and there's nothing she can do about it. So in this situation, what we would expect is in the queenless side, the best individual amongst them, not the hair designate, but amongst them, the best individual would become the potential queen. Now, let her call her PQ1. Now we move her and the queen, we interchange, and here she should not be accepted because she's not the hair designate. She should actually be challenged or she should drop her aggression. And the true hair designate should now stand up and say, I am the next queen and become hyper aggressive. But not, that's not the end of the story. The acid test for PQ2 is that when we move her to the opposite side, she should also be acceptable to that side because she is the true hair designate. In other words, our predictions are that the PQ1 should be unacceptable to the opposite side in about half the experiment and a second potential queen should emerge on that side. However, the PQ2 should be acceptable to both sides and there should be no PQ3. In, whenever we cut the nest in two halves, there should be only two potential groups. Now, the student who wanted to do this decided to do this experiment. They're very hard to do, they're very tedious experiment, but it's, uh, the stakes are so high that she spent two years doing these experiments. She found that in some experiments, the first individual to become hyper aggressive was able to hold on to her position on both sides and she was not challenged. This probably corresponds to a situation where the hair designate was on the opposite side. But in the remaining five experiments, the first potential queen was challenged, but it was not successful on the other side, a second individual emerged. In other words, the PQ2 emerged in about 50% of the cases, no PQ3 emerged, both predictions seem to be upheld, so there does seem to be hair designate. But what is our confidence that there was no who the hair designate is, who the next PQ is? It is remarkable that the PQ2, the second individual to become hyper was never challenged. She did not receive a single act of aggression by PQ1 or by any other workers, either when she emerged in the presence of the PQ1 or when she was moved to the opposite. And that is why we believe that the hair designate was obviously known and acceptable to all the was, including the PQ1. Even the PQ1 knew that this is not my turn yet. And therefore, we were able to publish a paper with the title, we know that the wasps know because there are cryptic hair cells cryptic successors to the hair, uh, to the throne in Ropaladia marginata. At this point, it seemed to us, so there is a hair designate, even though we cannot identify her in the presence of the queen. The wasps seem to know who she is. At this stage, we said, even the wasps know who the PQ is. So the next student who came to my lab said, how do you know that there is just one potential queen? Maybe there are several potential queens standing in line. And we answer this question in a simple way. We remove the queen, identify the PQ by her behavior, immediately remove her and see what happens. And it turns out that in the presence of the queen, nobody shows aggression. Remove the queen, one and only one individual becomes hyper aggressive, a PQ1. Remove her and after remaining was, one and only one individual becomes hyper aggressive. Let's call her PQ2. Remove her. Of the remaining was one and only one. So PQ3, PQ4, PQ5. Every time one wasp becomes hyper aggressive and she is not challenged. In fact, I'll blow this up to show that these blue bars here are supposed to be the dominance received by the potential queen, which is essentially zero. So the individuals know when it is their turn, they become hyper aggressive and they do not receive any aggression. So there is a long reproductive queue of at least five potential queens, but perhaps the Q is even longer. Maybe all individuals are in the queue. So we said, even the wasps know, can we really not predict the potential queen in the presence of the queen? So at this stage, we revisited this question. And here we collaborated with Professor Noah Painter Wallman from the University of California, Los Angeles. And we used what is called multi-layer network analysis. In the past, each social situation was examined in isolation. We have now used the novel analytic approach of multi-layer network that combines multiple social situations into a single mathematical object. A multi-layer network accounts for the differential impacts of different social situations on each other, as well as on the overall global social dynamics of the society. A multi-layer net network measure, which is called versatility, reports the importance of an individual in the society while accounting for all social situations simultaneously. So in this study, we use, the social situations we used were aggression, prophylaxis, 
solid food exchange and spatial overlap. And it turns out that in the multi-layer network analysis, the number of individuals the PQ interacted with was significantly higher than 95% of the values obtained in the randomized scenario. When examining each social situation separately, there was no such pattern. So by using this method, we could actually show that in the multi-layer analysis, we could identify who the potential queen was, even in the presence of the queen. This could not be done using the other individual situations individually. So we can probably identify the potential queen after all. Although I want to say probably, because the real experiment I want to do is to collect the data, behavioral data, do the multivariate network analysis, identify the potential queen, then remove the queen and show that the one whom we identified in fact becomes the potential queen. This has not yet been done. But even before that, another question arises, a new puzzling question. How do the rest of the workers recognize the PQ without the aid of multivariate network analysis? As far as we know, WASP don't seem to use multivariate network analysis, at least not the kind that Noah Pinter Wallman has taught us to use. So only future work will tell how this might be possible. That leads us to other questions. Now, we were struck throughout this study by the fact that there's so much peace, so much cooperation in the colony. We wanted to see conflict. We were itching to see a fight. So we asked a different question. How does the queen maintain her status and why does she sometimes lose it? Most of the time, the queen is in complete control. Nobody challenges her. But suddenly, overnight, she loses her status and a new individual becomes a queen. How is this possible? Or how does this happen? So in order to answer this question, we did the following experiment. We transferred the queen and all the workers into a cage, but deprived them of their nest. So we took only the wasps and put them in a cage. Now the wasps were flying around in the cage, but there was no nest. And what we thought was now the queen cannot rub her pheromone on the nest, cannot convey her presence, and therefore she will be overthrown. But she was not overthrown. Why was she not overthrown? Because the queen frantically continued to rub her abdomen on the walls of the cage and therefore she maintained her status. But we argued that if she's rubbing the same amount of pheromone on the vast surface of the nest rather than on the small surface of the nest, there must be a dilution of this pheromone and there must be a signature of this dilution. Indeed, there was. For the first time, we saw that the workers attacked the queen, which they never do in normal court. But then why did she not lose her status? Again, for the first time we saw that the queen retaliated. She almost never shows aggression in a normal, in a normal colony. So we saw two very unusual behaviors. Workers attack the queen, queens attack the workers and maintain the status. In other words, the queen maintains her status as long as she has sufficient pheromone, which she can display to the workers. This tells us that there is potential for conflict, but it is usually prevented from coming to the fore. And this ability of the was to prevent conflict from coming to the fore by presenting a harmonious social life is what interests us greatly. But we wanted to see more aggression, more fighting. We wanted to see more of this. And therefore we asked a different question. What about conflict with outsiders? Surely the was probably show more conflict with outsiders. How do the was treat other wasps from, of the same species from other colonies. In order to answer this question, we did yet another kind of experiment. And we introduced all the members of one colony into the cage of another colony. We had two colonies in the lab, two healthy colonies. We took all the adult wasps from one colony, left the nest and brood as it is, and introduced them to the other colony. So in this colony, we had resident workers with their nest and alien workers without their nest. And what we found was remarkable. The residents treated the young alien workers in a very different way. They were freely admitted to the colony, no problem. But old alien workers were allowed to live, but only away from the nest. They were attacked as soon as they came close to the nest. Most interestingly, the alien queen was attacked and killed. She was actually torn to pieces. So it turns out that the residents showed a very nuanced differential treatment to the intruders. This we found absolutely fascinating because it does not just beat up everybody. But this also provided another clue to us. Because the young aliens are accepted, we wanted to know what is the fate of these young accepted aliens? What happens to them after they are accepted? We found that young alien workers who are accepted into foreign colonies became completely integrated into their foster colonies and normal workers as normal workers and may even become future queens. 
We even found that the probability of a foreign worker becoming a queen is directly proportional to the number of foreigners in the colony. So they had no real disadvantage whatsoever. Now we said there is another way that the wasps can become selfish. They can leave the nest. So we wanted to know which wasps leave their natal nest and found new nests. We see from time to time some wasps leave their natal nest and found new. Who is, who is this wasp? Which wasp? What was she doing? Why some leave and others don't leave? To answer this question, we had to study new nest foundation. It turns out that new nest foundation has been very hard to study for some very trivial reason. In the field, we see wasps leaving their nest, but we don't know where they go. In the we also see new nests being founded, but we don't know where they come from. Now, in the laboratory, in the smaller cages, which we used earlier, there appears not to be enough space. So we never saw new nest foundation. So to solve this problem, we constructed, as I showed earlier, these walk-in cages where the student could sit inside the cage, but there was enough space for the wasp to build new nests. And in the very first attempt, in these walk-in cages, we observed 29 new nest foundations from nine parent nests. We collected nine healthy nests from, from the field, introduced each one into a walk-in cage, and we observed 29 new nest foundations, nine single foundress nests, and 20 multiple foundress nests. And here, we knew where the wasps came from, where they went, who joined with whom, so we could study the whole dynamics. And the way we studied that was very simple. We kept a daily diary of the happenings in these walk-in cages. What happens to the queen in the old nest, which wasp leaves and starts a new nest, who is the queen in the new nest, do they go back, etc. So we kept it. So this, for example, is a very simple situation where not much happened. And here is a very complex situation where a lot of things happen. By simply keeping a diary of this, we were able to observe very unusual behaviors. Wasps congregated outside their parent nest and showed dominant subordinate interactions before initiating multi -founder, multiple foundress nests. We have never seen this in other situations. Solitary foundresses never participated in such off nest aggregations. The most dominant wasps of the aggregations always become the queens in multiple foundress nests. Others became co foundresses or did not join the new nest. By simply looking at these aggregations, we could predict who will be the queen in the new nest. Most interestingly, some wasps which appear to have lost out in the negotiations decided to go back and remain with the old nest, maybe try their luck on another, on another day. But some of them went with the dominant individual and became subordinates in the new nest. Solitary foundresses and future queens of multiple forests always engaged in self-feeding behavior. Now, we never see the wasps feeding themselves outside the nest. They always bring food to the nest, share it with other nest mates and feed there. But for the first time, we observed that wasps sit outside the nest and feed themselves. And they, they did so before initiating the new nest. So behaviorally dominant and well-fed wasps tend to leave their natal nest to found new nests, either singly or jointly. But they prepare for this future by altering their behavior both on and off the nest. Now, this suggested a different theoretical framework for us. This suggested that now we could test the hypothesis that wasps are not pre programmed robots. Modeling their evolution as a competition between. between bearers of alternate alleles with fixed behaviors can be misleading. Clearly, the wasp must be making and changing decisions continuously based on updating their information about their internal state and the state of their external world. This gives us the hope that we can change their behavior by changing their internal state or the external world around them. In other words, we can manipulate these wasps and change their behavior if we really understand what makes the wasps social, what makes them selfish, what makes them altruist, altruist, then we must be able to change their levels of selfishness and altruism by changing what we think makes them selfish or altruism. So in other words, we asked, can we make them less or more selfish? So the question we asked, can we alter using inclusive fitness jargon, we can ask the question, can we alter their relative dependence on direct and indirect fitness? So the question is, can we make the wasp more or less selfish at our will? We tried, and I'm glad to say we succeeded. So here is our experiment to make the wasp more selfish. 
We transplanted 12 R marginata nests into the waste piri, each one into a separate cage. We randomly assigned the nest into either a, as a control nest or a treatment nest. We had six control nests and six test nests. In the control nest, in all nests, we provided ad libitum food. We usually give them Corsera cephalonica larvae, honey and water every day to all nests. But in the test nest, additionally, we hand fed the wasps. We hand fed the wasps in addition to the ad libitum food. During the each hand feeding session, we offered larvae, that is Corsera cephalonica larvae, to each adult female present on the nest until the time they did not accept any more larvae. Now, to, we wanted to know whether we had succeeded in increasing the nutritional state of the wasp in the test nest. So we calculated, we showed that there was indeed a 1.7 fold increase in the food intake in the test nest compared to the control nest. This is per capita food consumption per day was 1.7 fold higher in the test nest compared to the control nest. Now we could compare the two types of nests for their selfish or altruistic behavior. We showed that the rates of nest foundation per nest per day increased threefold in the test nest where the wasps were better fed. The rates of queen turnover, in fact, challenging existing queens and replacing, that rate increased 12-fold in the test nest compared to the control nest. We could also treat food intake as a continuous variable rather than categorize into control nest and test nest. We can plot per capita food consumption uh, of the wasp in the nest on the x-axis, and we can plot nest foundation per nest per day, queen turnover per nest per day on the y-axis, and show that there's statistically increased higher probability of both nest foundation and queen turnover as a function of food intake. So the answer is that yes, we can make them more selfish. We can make them have a higher probability of leaving their nest and founding new nests and getting more direct fitness. This, of course, raises another new puzzling question. Why do the wasps not feed enough on their own and become more selfish? We provide them ad libitum food. There's always food left over. They don't feed. They wait for us to hand feed them, and then they become selfish. Now you can see this is a fascinating question, but again, only future will tell. So the saga of questions and answers continues as it should. Every answer leads to another question, and that question if you answer it, lead to another question. This will continue, and I hope it will continue for a very long time. Now, I have tried to convey this in many forms. The, there's a much older book we have written called Survival Strategies, in which I try to place our own research in the context of the larger field of behavioral ecology and evolutionary biology. I've written a more technical monograph called The Social Biology of Ropalidia Marginata. More recently, I've written a book called Experiments in Animal Behavior. Now, I, I want to emphasize the subtitle of this book. It's called Cutting Edge Research at Trifling Cost. You may have noticed that all the experiments we did were low cost. We really needed almost nothing. And we deliberately, I deliberately designed my research to be inexpensive, low cost, keeping in mind the state, the situation we are in our country where we don't have that much money. So we, as whenever possible, we replace dollars with ideas and another pair of eyes and another pair of hands. So that is the idea. Now, in this book, what I try to do is six of the 16 chapters in this book are about Ropalidia marginata. But I try to pick up from the literature experiments in other species, both invertebrates and vertebrates, where one can actually do low cost research, cutting edge research at trifling cost. I've also tried to convey this to a much wider public audience. I now write a monthly column in a publication in a online publication called The Wire Science. And my column is called More Fun Than Fun. Every month I, I write an article trying to convey the spirit and joy of science to a general audience. And as you can imagine, often my articles are about evolution, about behavior, about social insects. I want to close by thanking my very large number of passionate students. We have, of course, received some funding by various Government of India agencies. But as I said, we have tried to keep our research as low cost as possible. These, the students are really the powerhouse of my lab. And it has been a great pleasure working with these students, using their ideas, using their questions to answer this way. So it has been a wonderful journey, which I've enjoyed very much. And I am really grateful to have the opportunity to present all of this to you. I will stop here and I'll be happy to take any further questions. Thank you very much.